All right, well, as I've said this evening, we are going to be looking at the anointing, okay, the anointing of the Spirit, how He confirms the Word. Uh, but there's two purposes to this sermon. As I've said, it's the, the grand finale, so it's going to be the, you know, all the fireworks, so to speak. We, we do want to go through those things again. So the introduction and the review is going to be by far the lengthiest part. I do want to um, add a little bit to what we saw last week with regard to the fine-tuning of, of the universe. I think that's fascinating and also just wonderful evidence uh, just to know how, how those dials, you know, in this universe-making machine can't really be tweaked, you know, very, they can't be tweaked, be tweaked at all, really, and they have to be in, within such specific parameters. You know, it's, it's he, as um, Stephen Meyer said, it's not that the parameters exist, but that they are so precise and have to be precisely what they are for life to exist. So anyway, we're going to look a little bit at that and uh, look at, at a few more of the evidences, um, in particular the unity of the Bible, uh, the preservation of the Bible, the power of the Bible, before we get to that final one, which is really only going to take a few minutes toward the end. Okay, so uh, anyway, let's begin with the, the text, 1 John 2. Verses 20 through 27, and again, the point here is that anointing, uh, the Spirit of God and what He does for us. John writes, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which He Himself made to us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Okay, if, if nothing else comes out from this passage, it's certainly the idea of the Spirit of God, the anointing confirms the truth in our lives, gives us the conviction of that. And from that, we understand He will do that for all of God's truth, and that would include the Bible. And this is that indispensable work of the Spirit's illumination that comes with regeneration that gives us that conviction that these things are true. They are the Word of God. Well, Let's go ahead and begin, though, this evening by reviewing the evidence we've seen so far in this series that the Bible is God's Word before we move on to the final evidences. Now, my goal here is not to recount everything that we've seen, but rather just to provoke your memories, to see, you know, to remember the main points, um, and hopefully to kind of simplify that uh, a little bit. Okay, so remember, first of all, we saw that the Bible makes the claim to be the Word of God. If it didn't do that, as R.C. said, there wouldn't be any sense in, in attempting to prove that it's the Word of God. Well, Jesus tells us in Scripture that the Scripture itself, by which He means the Old Testament, cannot be broken, which means it cannot fail to be true or come to pass. It is God's Word. When He spoke... He claimed to be speaking God's Word. Remember what Jesus says in uh, John 12, verse 49, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father Himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. So Jesus says the Old Testament is God's Word. He says His Word is God's Word. Then He promised the apostles His Holy Spirit not only to remember what he had said so they could write it down and what he did, but also that they might explain it further. 
John 14, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And he would show them what is coming. He says in John 16, 13, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Bible makes the claim that it is God's word. Okay? Again, the Old Testament and even the writings of the New Testament, everything in the New Testament was, was written either by an apostle who had these promises, right? Or by a close associate of an apostle who had their supervision and their approval. If there was something wrong, the apostles could have pointed that out, but, but they didn't. Now, secondly, the Bible is not only claims to be the Word of God, but R.C. said we shouldn't start with the Bible as the Word of God, but rather after we've proven the existence of God, we need to start with the Bible as simply a reliable historic document. And I think maybe that, that probably would have been maybe the best first place, you know, the best first point to start at. What it records is reliable, which means that what Jesus said and what you know, records him saying about the Old Testament and about his apostles is accurate. But as we were looking at this particular point, we saw that everything that can be proven in the Bible, really through archaeology, has been proven. Let me just give you this quote again from Sir William Ramsey, a British New Testament scholar. He writes this, I take the view that Luke's history is unsurpassed in its trustworthiness. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historian, and they will stand the keenest scrutiny and the harshest treatment. Now, the history that Luke records in his gospel essentially authenticates or verifies the history that we have in the other gospels, agrees with it, and the history in the book of Acts does the same for most of the New Testament letters. Now, again, this was R.C.'s main argument if we treat the Bible as reliable history, we need to, to see that the Bible contains several eyewitness accounts of Jesus doing miracles, which proves that he is a messenger from God. And as a messenger from God, um, he tells us that the Bible is his word. Okay, so he's authenticated by God, the God who exists, we see from the creation. And he says, as an authenticated messenger of God, not only his words, but the Old Testament and what the apostles would write is the word of God. Now, thirdly, we, we looked at the fact that of all the, all the books in the world that claim to be the word of God, only the Bible reveals the God that we see from the creation, okay? which shouldn't surprise us because, again, the Bible is the word of God. So remember the things that we saw about God in the creation that he is eternal, infinite, independent, and unchangeable. Hopefully, again, this will bring back some memories. He is personal, self-aware, intelligent, and purposeful. And he is morally good, benevolent, angry, just, and he is patient. Now, really, of all the books that claim to be the Word of God, only the Bible reveals this God. So we should eliminate, of course, all the others. And this is, again, more confirmation that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, fourthly, and we spent a good amount of time on this, the Bible contains prophecies, detailed predictions of events that would take place many years before they actually took place. And they took place precisely as the Bible said they would. And again, we looked at a few things. Remember we saw that there was a prediction about the city of Tyre, that great merchant city that was on the coast, you know, that was very important for trade, that it would literally be scraped off the land and thrown into the ocean, and it came to pass exactly as God said it would. But that prediction was made 254 years before the event took place. Of course, we have many predictions regarding Christ, that God would send his son into the world, that he would be conceived supernaturally. He'd be born in Bethlehem. We, we looked at that prophecy 
the, of Daniel, about the 70 weeks, that tells us when he would begin his ministry to the year, how long it would last, when it would end, and how it would end. And, of course, we know from Scripture as well a prediction that he would be raised from the dead. Now, all of these things that I've just mentioned have been verified through the eyewitness testimony of the Scripture. And when you're thinking about events that took place in the past before the advent of the camera, you know, this is really the only way that you, you can verify these things is through eyewitness accounts. And God has given to us many in Scripture. Now, we also saw a very important one. Jesus told us what was going to happen leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, what was going to happen when that judgment actually came, and what was going to happen immediately following that judgment. He even gave us a time frame in which all those things were going to take place, which was within a generation or 40 years, and it happened exactly as he said it would. Now, the point is this, that only God, who has infinite knowledge, can tell us what's going to happen before it takes place. Uh, that's the way he distinguishes his prophets from false prophets, is that when they say something's going to happen, it actually does happen, because God, who knows the future, is the one who has spoken through them. The Bible must be his word. Now, fifthly, we saw that science confirms the Bible, and that's what all those videos were about that we were watching, and certainly they can uh, explain this much better than I can, but I'm just going to give you a synopsis of the things we saw. We saw that, as God tells us in Genesis, that he made one man and one woman, and that everyone living is descended from Adam and Eve. Science has verified that we all descend from a common human ancestor. That's not something that science has always believed. They believe that we all come from a, a common ancestor, but as we branched off, we branched off and became monkeys and, and apes, and, and then man sort of evolved in different parts of the world, and that accounted for the different races. But as you recall, Ken Ham pointed out genetically, we're all one race from one pair of parents. And really all the differences that exist between us, you know, just think of the peoples of the world that look as different from us as, as anyone can. That, that that's only a very small percentage of information on the DNA molecule accounts for that. We are, we are the same. And the fact, of course, that we know that we can have, well, uh, as different ethnicities intermarry, they can have children, which shows, that, of course, that we are all from, uh, we are all of the same, what do I want to say, species, okay? Well, we also saw that the Bible says that God made all the animals after their kind, that they would have offspring according to their kind and only according to their kind. And remember what the evidence shows us from the fossil record, that animals suddenly appear fully formed with no antecedent transitional life forms, nothing that they came from that appears in, in, the, uh, in the fossil record. And once they appear, they remain exactly the same. Okay, so God says in his word, he made animals, made certain kinds of animals that would reproduce according to their kind, and that's exactly what we see happening in the fossil record. The Bible says that God flooded the, the earth, the entire world, to the point where the tops of mountains everywhere under heaven were covered, I believe, up to a, a depth of 15 cubits. Now, geology, remember, has revealed worldwide sandstone deposits that, that cover the entire earth, sedimentary rock that is laid down by water, and those sedimentary layers contain fossils. You know, one thing, I'm not sure, um, I, I know that Stephen Meyer didn't, didn't take this into account, but I know that creation science does, but fossils only form when the animal is suddenly buried by wet soil. That, that's the way they form. And I remember the, that, um, I forget whether it was Andrew Snelling, was telling us, you know, when a fish dies, it doesn't just go to the bottom of the ocean and sit there waiting to become a fossil. It bloats and it floats and, and the critters in the ocean eat it up. And, 
if something dies on land, same thing happens. It, you know, it, it does bloat and it gets eaten. And we've seen vultures doing that. But even if it doesn't, it just rots and turns into dust and does not create fossils. You know, fossils are only formed by sudden burial in, in wet soil. And that's where all these fossils came from. They were suddenly buried by wet soil, which means that there was a lot of wet soil around to bury millions of, of creatures uh, at some time in history. Uh, and the interesting thing is every one of those layers, and this is what you also don't hear from the evolutionists, but every one of those layers contains mostly marine fossils, okay? So at some point, all this stuff was mixed up together and then settled out in these sedimentary layers. There was a flood that covered the earth because this you know, phenomenon is worldwide. Now, God tells us he created the world in six days and the genealogies, you know, that from the genealogies, we can deduce that the world is a little bit more than 6,027 years old. Answers in Genesis would say 6,000, you know, around 6,000 years old. Well, remember the critique of radiometric dating. Uh, and this was probably the, the really difficult section, was it? So, but, but the main point was, was this, that when we're looking at you know, trying to date something by the amount of the radioactive element it contains, what we call the, the parent uh, atoms and then the daughter atoms. The problem is we don't know how much of the parent atom there was to begin with and how much of the daughter when that thing formed, okay? How much of both was there? We don't know. And then these systems are open systems which means that some of the parent atoms are being added and they're being subtracted and some of the daughter atoms are being added and subtracted. So how much has been added, how much has been subtracted? Well, there, there's really no way of knowing. And then the radioactive decay rates, have they been constant throughout, throughout history? That's also something that has been proven not to be true. So we can't trust those, those rates. We can't trust those dating methods. But as they also pointed out, there's many processes going on in the world that also give an indication of just how old the world is. And those processes indicate that the world is less than 10,000 years old. And here's just a few of them. The amount of sediment that's on the ocean floor with all the, the soil that's being dumped into it year after year from the rivers, it should be much deeper than it is if the world were millions of years old the concentration of salt in the water. It should be much higher if the world is, is older, but we know the rate of it and it, it indicates that the world is relatively young. Soft tissue found in dinosaur bones are, you know, usually a fossil is where uh, the, uh, the minerals that are in that wet soil have replaced all of the organic tissue and now you have just, just rocks there that are in the shape of the animal that was buried. But what if you, you know, if, if this animal supposedly was buried millions of years ago, and yet there's still organic tissue that's there, you see that, that couldn't happen if it was that old, which, and as a matter of fact, the organic tissue cannot last for more than a few thousand years apparently. And so that also indicates relative, you know, a young earth. The decay rate of the Earth's magnetic field, the fact that comets still exist because they, they actually go out of uh, existence fairly quickly. They're just frozen balls of water and mud that disintegrate as they're orbiting around, uh, you know, in, inside our solar system. So all these things point to a young Earth. And then we began to get into some of those interesting, well, these are interesting, but also those interesting videos Peter Robinson, the roundtable discussion, and, and the discussion by Stephen Meyer, the Bible says that God created man. The intelligence created, you know, um, life. And science continues to find the evidence of intelligent design. First of all, we saw within the cells. Whereas Darwin may have thought that the cell was just a blob of jello, we now know that a cell is really more like a miniature city that has machines of all kinds to do all different kinds of things to 
allow the cell to live. And all these machines are made up of all these different parts that all have to exist at the same time and be perfectly fitted together in order to work. And the cell is filled with machines like that. And in order for those machines to be there, there also has to be the information to build those machines. And all that information is also present encoded in digital form on the DNA molecule. Now, as Stephen Meyer said, we, we also know from science that information can only come from a mind. It cannot come from chemistry. It cannot come from matter. It only comes from mind. And so the cell shows us intelligence and intelligence was involved in the creation of that. And then what we saw last week where the Bible, of course, tells us there was an ultimate beginning to the heavens and the earth. Stephen Meyer gave us two further proofs of that truth, right? Of a designing intelligence. And the first one had to do with the expanding universe and gravity. They proved that there was an absolute beginning. This is really mind-blowing, I think. An absolute beginning to time, space, matter, and energy. I can't really conceive of an existence without space. But apparently from Einstein's theory, if you take the expansion of the universe and turn back the clock, since the universe is expanding away from us in a spherical form, if you turn back the clock and all that matter comes together, Einstein had a theory where if you have in increasing mass, you have increasing gravity, and this increasing gravity curves space around it. I have no idea how that works, okay? But this is, this is what Einstein believed. And he saw that as he went back to the beginning point, that as, as all this mass comes together, the gravitational forces would be so great that curve, the curvature of space would become infinite, which means there would be no space. And if there's no space, there can be no matter. Einstein's theory proved mathematically that there was an ultimate beginning to the universe. And then remember, he, he couldn't accept that, so he, he formed this uh, gravitational constant, I forget exactly what he calls it, cosmological constant that is like this force fighting against gravity that allows it to have no beginning. But then when he was invited to look through a telescope, I think it was from the astronomer Hoyle, or no, it was Hubble, who, who showed him the red shift. He said, you're right, I was wrong, and this is the greatest mistake that I ever made, that there is a beginning to the universe, a beginning to, to matter and energy, time and space, okay? And as Meyer pointed out, if, that, if there was a time when there was you know, no matter and energy and time and space, since something can come from nothing, as uh, R.C. Sproul reminded us, there must be something that transcends the universe that brought this into being, okay, that, that created all of those things. You know, another thing that blew my mind is I looked at Answers in Genesis, and I don't really have the material in front of me, but it was talking about that red shift, and it, and it said this, that, the, that these galaxies that are moving away from us, and I don't, I don't understand this distinction, but I'll just tell you what they said that they're not really moving away from us, but what's happening is that space is expanding. You know, and as space expands, they're moving away from us, you know, and that's what's causing the red shift. So I don't get that, under, that distinction, but the idea that space is continuing to grow is, is kind of a mind-blowing concept, isn't it? The, the universe is getting bigger. It's not just, again, in this idea, it's not just space is out there in infinite directions and these galaxies are continuing to move out into space but as they move out space is expanding you know, anyway it's just it's mind-blowing and it 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 just makes you again think about how great god is i mean even if we just look at how far away these galaxies are now and how many trillions of galaxies there are out there like the milky way galaxy in which we live which is already so gigantic and that God spoke that into existence with a word. Okay. Well, anyway, there was this ultimate beginning. Secondly, Meyer pointed out, the fine-tuning of the universe proves that, it, that its cause is intelligent. Now, I wanted to fill that out just a little bit. And I got, I got this from Answers in Genesis and from an article that's entitled, The Universe is Finely Tuned for Life. 
But there were a couple of things in here that weren't explained, so I looked around for a little bit more information and um, found some things maybe to elucidate a little bit more. Okay, so. Um, all right, this, this is what, what it writes, or what Answers in Genesis says. Strong evidence for a designer comes from the fine-tuning of the universal constants and the solar system. For example, the electromagnetic coupling constant, or the electromagnetic coupling constant binds electrons to protons in atoms. If it was smaller, fewer electrons could be held. Now, what are the consequences of that? I'm not quite sure, except perhaps if there's fewer electrons, that means fewer molecules can be formed, fewer compounds. But it goes on to say this. If it was larger, electrons would be held too tightly to bond with other atoms. In other words, compounds couldn't be created and life couldn't exist. So this electromagnetic coupling constant that binds electrons to protons in an atom, you know, the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and the electrons are orbiting around, if that force that holds them together was stronger or weaker, life wouldn't be possible. The ratio of electron to proton mass, which is 1 to 1,836, if it was larger or smaller, molecules could not form. Carbon and oxygen nuclei have finely tuned energy levels. Okay, that, that's all it said, so I, I went to find a little bit more information, and this is what I found from another source. Carbon is the element upon which all known life is based. Carbon atoms form in the cores of stars by fusion reactions. If these reactions, or excuse me, in these reactions, three helium atoms collide and fuse together to make a carbon atom. However, in order for that fusion reaction to work, the energy levels must, must match up in just the right way, or the three helium atoms would bounce off each other before they could fuse. To create this unusual matchup of energies, two physical forces, the strong and electromagnetic forces, must cooperate in just the right way. The slightest change to either the strong or electromagnetic forces would alter the energy levels, resulting in greatly reduced production of carbon. The values are tuned so that carbon is produced efficiently, leading to abundant amounts of an element that we need for life. Okay, now back to uh, Answers in Genesis. Electromagnetic and gravitational forces are finely tuned so the right kind of star can be stable. Now, this is the point that, that um, Myers was making, or, or Meyer, Meyer made, okay? And here I have to go outside of this because that's all it said in Answers in Genesis, so here's another elucidation. The strength of gravity, and by the way, that gravity that exists is something that um, exists no matter how far apart two objects are there is still gravity that is exerting a force between them. So in other words, the galaxies that are maybe, you know, trillions of light stars, I'm not sure how far they're out there, but uh, however far out there they are, that galaxy is affected by this pulpit. It's affected by our existence. There is a f we're connected by that gravitational force. Now, it's not as strong as it would be if we were closer, but it's still there. But this, okay, the strength of gravity has to be exactly right for stars to form. But what do we mean by exactly? Well, it turns out that if we change gravity by even a tiny fraction of a percent, enough so that you would be, say, one billionth of a gram heavier or lighter, you and I would be a billionth of a gram heavier or lighter due to the change in gravity the universe becomes so different that there are no stars, galaxies, or planets. And with no planets, there would be no life. Change the value slightly, and the universe moves along a very different path. And remarkably, every one of these different paths leads to a universe without life in it. Okay, so this is what science has concluded. Gravity is so finely tuned that life is possible. And it's only possible with this particular setting, okay? Now, our sun is the right color. If it was redder or bluer, 
photosynthetic response would be weaker. We can be able to grow plants. Our sun is also the right mass. If it was larger, its brightness would change too quickly and there would be too much energy, high energy radiation. If it was smaller, the range of planetary distances able to support life would be too narrow. The right distance would be so close to the star that tidal forces would disrupt the planet's rotational period. UV radiation would also be inadequate for photosynthesis. So if the sun's mass were to change, life would not be possible. The Earth's distance from the sun is crucial for a stable water cycle. Too far away and most water would freeze and too close, most water would boil. The Earth's gravity, axial tilt, rotational period, magnetic field, crust thickness, oxygen nitrogen ratio, carbon dioxide, water vapor and ozone levels are just right. Former atheist Sir Fred Hoyle, and I believe Stephen Meyer quoted this, states, common sense interpretation of the facts is that a super intelligence has monkey, remember the, the, the term monkey, with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces in nature. Former atheist, notice Sir Fred Hoyle, the astronomer. Okay, now remember that Stephen Meyer said this, it's not only that these parameters exist, but they are so finely tuned, so narrowly set, again, that to change them one way or the other would make life impossible. So it's not just that they're there, but that they're so finely tuned. So again, the red shift and the idea of an expanding universe shows that there was you know, an absolute beginning. An absolute beginning requires a beginner that transcends the universe, and the fine-tuning of the universe requires an intelligent being to fine-tune it. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, science confirms what the Bible says. Now, that's review. I told you that was going to be the lion's share of what we're looking at this evening. But in the remaining time, let's just consider a few more arguments. And I'm, I'm bringing this to a close because we're going to want to um, not, not next Lord's Day or perhaps the Lord's Day after that, but the one after that, we're going to shift again as we're heading into Reformation time. We're going to shift again to church history and watch a series together uh, in the evenings. So I want to wrap this up uh, before we get there. So in our remaining time, let's just consider a, a few more arguments very briefly and then uh, close with that without which we really cannot embrace the Scriptures and have that full assurance and conviction, which is the Spirit's witness. So let's consider three things first. The Bible's unity, the Bible's preservation, and the Bible's power to transform lives. Now, I'm going to use quotes to, to just bring this all together because th these could be very lengthy subjects in and of themselves. So I'll use these quotes to, to, to just abbreviate. So first of all, it's unity. And this comes again from Answers in Genesis. And it's true. Quote, the Bible was written over a period of roughly 2,000 years by 40 different authors from three continents who wrote in three different languages. These facts alone make the Bible one of a kind, but there are many more amazing details that defy natural explanation. Shepherds, kings, scholars, fishermen, prophets, a military general, a cupbearer, and a priest all penned portions of scripture. We could add to that also farmer. <laughs> they had different immediate purposes for writing, whether recording history, giving spiritual and moral instruction, or pronouncing judgment. They composed their works from palaces, prisons, the wilderness, and places of exile while writing history, laws, poetry, prophecy, and proverbs. In the process, they laid bare their personal emotions, expressing anger, frustration, joy, and love. Yet, despite this marvelous array of topics and goals, the Bible displays a flawless internal consistency 
It never contradicts itself or its common theme. Now we could, we could add to that the fact that, they, that the Bible has perfect agreement on the most controversial subject in the entire world, you know, religion. From such diversity, okay, argues for a superintending mind, the unity of the Bible. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. It's breathed out by God. There's the superintending intelligence. No human you know, work of authorship has ever done such a thing. Uh, merely human. Okay. Secondly, it's preservation. Again, from Answers in Genesis, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 confirmed that we still have the same Old Testament as they did at Jesus' day. The survival of thousands of New Testament manuscripts confirms that the New Testament writings were also providentially preserved. The question among textual scholars is not whether some words are missing, but which variant readings in a few minor cases are the correct ones. That's true. In contrast, few copies have survived from nearly every other classic book, such as Caesar's Gallic Wars or Herodotus' History. While copies of major portions of the New Testament survive from documents dated around A.D. 300, most other classic books survive in copies no older than around A.D. 900. God's Word survived despite intense efforts to destroy it. For instance, in 175 B.C., the king of Syria, Antiochus Epiphanes, ordered the Jews on pain of death to destroy their scriptures and worship the Greek gods. But Judas Maccabeus saved the books and led a revolt that won independence for the Jewish nation. Today, Jews celebrate this event at Hanukkah. Another example is the Roman Emperor Diocletian's order to have Christianity outlawed, its leaders killed, and their Bibles burned. As a sign of God's providence, the next Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity and paid for 50 new handwritten copies of the Bible. The Bible has not only been preserved, but translated into over 2,000 languages, both ancient and modern. Many of the earliest surviving manuscripts include translations such as Syriac versions, showing that God's word was spreading from the very beginning, and the words of its message have been preserved in many languages. It's been pointed out that God's preservation of the word is also an argument it sets it apart from all other books that it's been so carefully preserved throughout the years and read, widely read, and translated. And then thirdly, its power to transform lives. Now, this really goes with the last point, but I'm going to just bring it up here because um, it's a little bit different. But Joel Behe writes this uh, on Ligonier's website in, in one, of the, um, one of the articles that's included there. And this is one of four points that he made, but the first point he made was God's word is quick and powerful. This is what he writes, by, by quick is meant living or imbued with life. This life of the word is no less than the life of God himself, for as God is, so must his word be. This life is also power or energy, power harnessed for work. The life of God's word is ordered and applied to the accomplishment of his purposes. My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where un, or where to I sent it. As living seed, God's word has power to bring forth fruit in the lives of believers, as described in the parable of the sower, where the seed is the word of God. Because the Word of God lives and abides forever, its vitality and potency remain both unexhausted and undiminished through time. Believers discover with Martin Luther that the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold on me. The Bible is not antique or modern. It is eternal. Now, as I've said, okay, that really connects to the last point. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith contains several more evidences, and these are primarily aimed at Rome. Remember, Rome said, 
the Bible is the Word of God because we declare it to be the Word of God, okay? So we should listen to it because the authority says we should listen to it, and the authority is Rome. But the Westminster divines were saying, no, it's not because the, the church says it, and they weren't talking about Rome when they said that. It's not because the church declares it to be. Because, you know, but it goes on to say this, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments by where, whereby it, it abundantly evidences itself to be the Word of God. So they're saying, all, you know, the Bible shows itself to be the Word of God in all these many ways, not because the church declares it. We, we might be moved by that and all these other evidences, okay? And that would include everything that we've seen up to this point. But then they move on to the most compelling argument. The conclusion of that paragraph is this. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. Notice not separate from the Word, but by the Word. In and with the word in our hearts. And that's really what John told us in our passage. And this is where we, we come to that in conclusion. Verse 27 of 1 John 2. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, this anointing, as I've said, is the Spirit whom the Lord gives to us in the new birth, who then confirms for us or teaches us about the truth, okay? Now, let's just think for a moment what that means. John is not saying that God gave us the Spirit as a substitute for the Word. You know, it, it is sad, but... <clears throat> There are those charismatic denominations that, that actually take this, what they think is the internal motion of the Spirit, as a substitute for the Word. They believe God is speaking to them. And that, um, that supersedes what He wrote in the Word. Now, well, no, that's not what, um, what He's saying. We shouldn't expect really direct communications from the Spirit today because the Word of God is complete. Nor is this again, anointing of the Spirit to be a substitute for the teaching ministry of the church because we know in other places in Scripture, for instance, Paul says, God has gifted the church with qualified teachers. Why would He give us teachers if we didn't need teachers? But what he is saying is the Spirit confirms the Word. He bears witness in our hearts that what we're reading, what we're hearing is God's Word. Now, this is the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, and the way it works is this, that the Spirit of God changes the way we view the Scripture. You know, whereas we might read, again, another uh, book written by someone that we might respect, I don't know, Charles Dickens or somebody like that, and we might even actually enjoy the book. When we read the Scripture, we see something different that it's not merely the writing of a human author, but we see the hand of God behind it. We see it as, as divine. As Edwards would say, the Spirit of God shows us the glory that is in it, and He draws our attention and our hearts towards it. Okay? Now, the, the point behind what Westminster is saying is this, and we need to realize it as well as a part of our apologetics, and with this I'll conclude. The objective evidence that we've looked at, all that evidence, can convince us that the Bible is God's Word, but we're never going to receive it, and we're never going to receive the one it points to, Christ, and we're never going to surrender to it 
unless and until our hearts have been changed by this work of the Holy Spirit, this anointing, which we call in theology illumination. We read in Westminster Confession of Faith, the next chapter from the one I just, not chapter, but the next paragraph from what I just read. This, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Here's the point. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. Now again, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that an unconverted person who doesn't have the Spirit, it doesn't mean they can't, I'm doing a double negative, aren't I? An unconverted person can pick up the Word of God, okay? And they can read it and they can understand it and they can understand God's way of salvation. They can understand, you know, all the message of the cross and that we need to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they cannot have a saving understanding of these things, which is not new content, but it's this new way of viewing it. The old way is I see it, but I don't want it. The new way is I see it and I want it, okay? That's what the Spirit of God does. He changes the disposition of our hearts towards the Word of God so that we'll, we, we will receive it, okay? We will trust in the Christ that it reveals. We will surrender to His law of love. So what that means is this, that as we share these proofs, these evidences, we need to be praying that the Lord would do that work that he would open the hearts of our hearers to respond to the Word of God in the same way that he did to ours when he originally brought us to himself. They need the new birth if they're going to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must not neglect that as we share with them, again, the apologetics having to do with the existence of God, the Word of God being his, the scriptures, and the message of the gospel that it proclaims. Well, we've looked at a lot. I hope some of it's provoked our memories and maybe brought back to mind some of these things, and hopefully we'll be able to use these things as we, you know, engage people and seek to bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Well, let's, let's bow for a, a moment of prayer.